Okay, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Kinga Godwin. I'm a policy impact um, postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Modern Languages at the University of Birmingham. And I would like to greet you all today and thank you for joining us uh, at, uh, at this webinar. Um, today we will be talking about uh, the inclusion and representation of uh, Central and Eastern European art and artists in the UK creative economies. This is a launch event of, um, for a policy uh, pro a report that outlines finding of a study uh, carried out by University of Birmingham, Centrala, and supported by the Arts and Humanities uh, Research Council. Now, before we start, I would like to explain a bit about the order of this webinar. So um, we will have the report key findings um, presented by Professor Sarah Jones, whom I will introduce in a moment. And um, this will be followed by the panel discussion uh, by our experts from uh, academia and the creative economies. And uh, we have three panelists with us today, whom I will also introduce um, in due course. Um, and after we've heard from the panelists, there will be time for questions and answers. Now, um, I hope that we will get you all involved. Um, we have many academics and policymakers and members of various cultural organizations and media and consulates uh, in the audience today. So I hope that um, this will create a good discussion. Um, the technical aspect, if you want to ask a question when there is time for questions, um, please type, type the question in the question and answer box. And then I will pass the questions to the panelists. Or alternatively, if you um, like really want to ask it yourself, please indicate that you want to do it and then um, we will unmute you. Um, so um, we just ask everyone to stay on topic and be respectful to our panelists and, um, and speakers. Um, so first we will start with um, Professor Sarah Jones, uh, who will, um, present the policy report uh, findings and uh, key findings and recommendations. Um, professor Sarah Jones is a professor at uh, Modern Languages at University of Birmingham. She is uh, the PI of the project uh, we will be discussing today. And um, she has collaborated with Centrala uh, before on other, uh, on other projects and on the representation of Central and Eastern European history and culture in the UK. Um, and one of them is a newly started grant on post-socialist um, Britain. So if I can now give, um, yes, that's from to Sarah. Sorry, just to check, are we uh, seeing uh, slides now? Uh, okay, great. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much, um, Kinga, and thank you also to everybody for coming. It's great to see such a good audience. Um, so this report, uh, In Between Spaces, was produced in a collaboration between the University of Birmingham um, and Centrala. Um, so the project has its origins uh, in an AHRC M3C Creative Economies Engagement Fellowship. Um, which was delivered by uh, Dr. Jakob Zegratz um, with myself um, and Centrala. Um, but the majority of the data collection that I'm um, going to report on here was carried out by uh, Marta Masika of Centrala Space. Um, so she's the art program coordinator there. Um, and Alicia Kaczmarek um, authored the recommendations of the report based on its key findings. So this really was a, a collaboration between academia um, and um, the creative economies. Um, I also want to give Centrala uh, credit as the originators of this research. Um, it was inspired by their long-standing work with CEE communities um, and their observations regarding the insufficiency of cultural representation um, and the difficulties experienced by migrant artists from the region. Um, we're also extremely grateful to the interviewees and survey participants uh, for giving up their time and sharing their experiences to support this research, which couldn't have happened without them. Um, so the full report is available to download from Centrala's website. Um, so what I'm going to do this evening is just run through some of the key findings um, and key evidence and outline our principal recommendations. Um, 
as King has said, this will be followed by a brief statement in response to the report by each of our panelists. Um, and then we want to open up the floor uh, for discussion with the audience. Um, so the methodology is, um, I'm not gonna go into that in detail, it's outlined in the report, but uh, basically it was a quantitative analysis of art, performance and film shown in Midlands art spaces and festivals over an eight year period a small scale qualitative survey with arts interested CEE communities in the Midlands um, and a series of one to one interviews with CEE artists in the UK. OK, um, so in terms of our key findings, um, so uh, the first two art and visual performance by Central and Eastern European artists is underrepresented in Midlands arts, gal art galleries, spaces and festivals in comparison to that produced by artists born in Western Europe and North America. Um, and this underrepresentation exists in a context in which Central and Eastern European migrants make up approximately 3.7% of the Midlands population, which is significantly higher than the population of Western European migrants, which sits at about 1.8%, and North American migrants, um, which is about 0.5%. Um, so the finding is really, uh, in principle, underpinned by our quantitative analysis of art, performance and film shown in Midlands art spaces and festivals over an eight year period. Um, so we looked at 787 acts in total. Um, and what we did is identified um, the country of birth and or nationality of the artists, performers um, involved in those productions. <clears throat> um, so this chart shows our results. Um, and across the board, um, across the board in terms of different art forms, we see a greater representation of Western European, and that excludes the UK, as you can see in the chart, um, and North American art and artists than work from any other geographical location, um, including Central and Eastern Europe, uh, European. Um, so Central and Eastern European art is uh, in between spaces here. We'd like to recognize that. Um, it does enjoy better representation than other non-European geographies. Um, however, considerably less representation than Western art if we understand that as um, Western European and North American. Um, and here we see the concept perhaps of Eastern Europe um, as a semi-periphery or close, what's been described as a close other reflected in the choice of who or what to exhibit and program. Um, then uh, the next two key findings uh, are based on the small scale qualitative survey with Central and Eastern European communities, arts interested communities. Um, so we had 63 respondents um, and of the 82.5% who offered an opinion on whether they would like to see more art from the region represented, 81% said they would. Um, so the survey showed that arts interested Central and Eastern European communities in the region engage with art by Central and Eastern European artists However, they principally find this in dedicated spaces such as Centrala, rather than in major regional galleries and festivals. Um, and these communities strongly support a greater visibility for artists from Central and Eastern Europe, citing a range of perceived benefits relating to well-being, identity, inclusion, and countering stereotypes. Um, and the qualitative responses to the survey give a sense of the impact of this underrepresentation and the perceived benefit of cultural representation for these communities. Um, so it's about um, creativity, about not being represented enough, about well-being, um, making the cultural scene more diverse and equal, and also the feeling that they have important things to say um, and that there, there isn't a kind of space um, for them to do so. Um, so our next set of findings uh, relate to the broader experience of Central and Eastern European migrants in the UK um, and how this impacts on cultural representation um, and inclusion. Um, so the representation of Central and Eastern European migrants in the UK uh, national press draws on racist tropes uh, to present these groups as a threat to the way of life in the UK and, and this is previous research has shown this. Um, the discourse surrounding the Brexit referendum in particular and its aftermath had a substantial focus on EU migration, particularly EU migration from Eastern Europe. Um, and in the wake of the vote to leave the EU, there was an increase in hate crimes directed against European migrants in the UK uh, and Central and Eastern European migrants were particularly affected. Um, so 
the majority of East, Central and Eastern European Europeans are white, so the form of discrimination that they experience is, is different to the racism encountered by visible minorities in the UK. Um, and it's sometimes called uh, xenoracism. Um, so xenoracism is a xenophobia that bears all the marks of the old racism, um, but is not color coded. Um, and that's how it's described by uh, Fikiti. Um, so xenoracism in this context is based on the construction of cultural difference that nonetheless draws on narratives and images produced in previous migrations. Um, so this is how we can describe Central and Eastern Europeans as finding themselves in a place in between. Um, so the majority identify as white, uh, but they are perceived as not quite white enough, uh, in inverted commas. They experience the privilege of invisibility as white migrants. However, this priv privilege is diminished when they do not have the cultural capital to perform whiteness in the way white British people do. Um, so the impact of this center racism on everyday and professional experience emerged clearly in the one-to-one -one interviews with Central and Eastern European migrant artists in the UK. Um, notably, uh, several artists felt that unconscious bias and stereotyping had impeded their access to a career in the UK's creative economies. Um, so you can see this from the quotations here. Um, the guy came and I think he was New Zealand, uh, from New Zealand, funnily enough. Um, I don't think he was even British. And he joked by saying, oh, so this is your new actress. I thought that all of them, um, as in Central and Eastern European migrants, were waitresses and cleaners. Um, the thing that I always say is that we've caused this earthquake in this country and people decided to vote for Brexit because of us. Where are we right? Uh, we're not visible. Where are we? Um, or when I try to hide that I come from this part of the world, let's say by using my husband's surname, still when they saw my CV with experiences from Zagreb in Croatia, I was immediately dismissed. Um, so the xenoracism experienced by Central and Eastern European migrants in the UK is exacerbated by and intersects with issues of socioeconomic status and class. Many migrants from the region were forced to downskill on their arrival to the UK, um, that is take up employment that required lower skills and qualifications than they possessed at the time. Um, and previous research suggests, um, and our research confirms, um, that they frequently find that the qualifications and experience they gained in their countries of origin are not recognized in the UK, meaning that Central and Eastern European migrants are far more likely to be overqualified and underpaid for their jobs than either Western European migrant or UK born workers. Um, so that's what previous research shows. Um, Central and Eastern Europeans thereby came to be stereotyped as low skilled migrants, which simultaneously contributed to the xeno racism experienced by these groups. Um, this is particularly important in the context of arts and culture because socioeconomic status is a key determining factor in cultural participation. Um, thus, there is an intersection of migrant experience and socioeconomic class. Migrant artists do not have the cultural and social capital of many of their UK born and we might say middle class peers, nor do they have the same access to networks gained through education in the UK and through parental support. Um, and the importance of class, undervaluation of CEE qualifications and experience, um, and the need for networks emerge clearly in our one-to-one -one interviews. Um, so I don't feel like people here actually acknowledge that, um, that it, um, so my, my qualifications meant anything. Uh, employers did not recognize either my education or my experience. Um, and then in terms of networks, um, I do think there is a kind of sense of familiarity, which is definitely harder to break through if you have just moved to the UK. Um, so migrant artists or migrants from Central and Eastern Europe thus experience a complex form of racialization, which results in microaggressions, verbal and even physical abuse. Um, however, Central and Eastern Europeans are not visible as a separate group in the data collected by, for example, Arts Council England, or indeed other surveys measuring participation in the arts. Um, most often they are encompassed in the ethnic grouping white other. Um, which would include all individuals who are white but not British, uh, for example, white Western Europeans, North Americans and Australians. Uh, it's therefore difficult to assess on a larger scale the impact of these practices of racialization on the artists and the communities of which they are part. Um, and this is one of the key difficulties we had with this research is, you know, where do we get this data from? Um, so an analysis of the ACE data report, Equality, Diversity and the Creative Case, um, published last year, 
highlights the in-betweenness of Central and Eastern Europeans within the UK's creative economies in this regard. So the report explicitly states that the category white other includes people from all other white backgrounds, um, including, for example, those from other European countries. Um, so that's how it's phrased in the report. However, the white other category is not including in the report's overview discussions of diversity, which in each section focuses on the inclusion and representation of, um, in their terms, uh, black and minority ethnic, disabled, female and LGBT artists and audiences. Where the data is reported in full, white other is recorded as a separate category to BME. Um, so those are our key findings. Um, and uh, the question is then, so what, what can we do about this? What do we recommend? Um, so it's a stated aim of Arts Council England to ensure that England's diversity is fully reflected in the culture it produces and that the cultural workforce is representative of contemporary England. Given that, given that Central and Eastern Europeans make up approximately 3.7% of the Midlands population, we might expect that this striving for diversity would include supporting this group and ensuring equality of opportunity for artists from these communities. Um, so we therefore suggest that funders, policymakers, policy influencers and policy implementers should uh, raise awareness among art and cultural organisations about the position of recent migrants to the UK and the need for and value of cultural representation, encourage more representative art programming, uh, promote decolonization as a strategy in art programming with the aim of decentering Western European and North American art and culture, a call for a wider review of the use of the BAME, BME categorization, a call for a review of ACE and other fund funders approach to measuring diversity uh, particularly use of the white other category, which works to exclude CEE art and artists from diversity measurements and reporting. Um, and furthermore, raise uh, greater cultural awareness to reduce negative stereotyping and unconscious bias, including against CEE migrants, raise awareness of discrimination and xenoracism experienced by CEE migrants, Review, review the widespread practice of non-recognition of CEE education and professional experience. Review anti-racist and diversity strategies to ensure wider inclusion of discriminated groups. And finally, encourage strategies that recognize the impact of intersectionality uh, when promoting diversity and inclusion. Okay, um, so that's it from me. Um, I'm going to hand back to Kinga um, to continue the discussion. Um, yes, so um, we will now start um, uh, another part of our webinar, which is a panel discussion, and I would like to uh, introduce our, our panelists. Um, so we will have about 10-15 minutes uh, per panelist, and uh, just a shout out to panelists that I will let you know if you are over the time, so I will be keeping time and I will let you know if you are, uh, we have like two minutes left. and. Um, so the first person on the panel is Alicia Kaczmarek, and she's a sociologist by background. She has background in sociology and social policy. She's the founder and director of Centala and the Polish Expat Association, which is a non-profit organization supporting the integration of Central Eastern European migrant communities and also promoting Central and Eastern European art and culture. Now, Centrala is based in Birmingham and it's the only public, um, publicly funded gallery of that type um, and the one that's most visited in, uh, in Birmingham. So Alicia has a lot of uh, practical experience and she will tell us about that as well. Um, and she will be the first one to speak. So maybe, um, Alicia, if I will maybe, um, give the platform to you now, and I will introduce um, other panelists before their, um, the, the, their talk. I think there will be probably more, it will make more sense. So. Great. Uh, thank you, Kinga. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. And uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. I'm really pleased to have so many people attending uh, other webinar. Uh, I'm so delighted this report is out. It's been something uh, we, uh, we were, 
thinking of doing for many, many years. And uh, when a couple of years ago, the opportunity to work with University of Birmingham happened, we were uh, over the moon. Uh, the report present experiences of Central and Eastern European migrants, uh, uh, which uh, are very, very familiar to all of us. Uh, it was our experience uh, um, for many years. Uh, I'm sure uh, I can speak for many uh, Central and Eastern Europeans here, but uh, the most important thing as a uh, running the organization Polish expat and Centrala in Birmingham, I was coming across those uh, experiences very often. And uh, hearing about uh, the discriminations and the racism, uh, uh, we all know it's happening everywhere, but uh, maybe we have the expectation in the art sector that it will be maybe a little bit less, <laughs> but um, um, unfortunately with uh, uh, EU enlargement where negative uh, press uh, reports follow the very negative stereotypes of Eastern Europeans uh, um, uh, arise um, and they also impact artists, creatives and how uh, Eastern Europeans and Eastern European art is perceived. So um, it's, uh, it's this feel of being, you know, second uh, category citizen or second category European citizens in, uh, in this country. Um, uh, uh, at Centrala, we focus on Central and Eastern European art and culture, and uh, we promote artists who actually live in the UK, but uh, we also bring artists from outside of the UK. So just wanted to clarify that it's not, uh, not, not fully about uh, uh, artists who lives here, but we understand art and culture in this wider sense and the presence, and, and you, we want to introduce uh, uh, Eastern European art and culture here to give me people uh, opportunity uh, to learn about this, uh, to learn about Eastern European uh, cultures, countries, uh, and art. So, um, uh, so working with the artists who are local and international and uh, uh, finding out that the uh, experiences are fairly similar. Uh, people, uh, artists who live here in the UK, uh, they face those institutional barriers, the education barriers, the employment barriers, as you can see in the reports and from the quotations. Uh, it happens quite often, but also artists who don't necessarily live here, they don't really feel that um, the art from uh, from the region is, is is quite appreciated here, so I, I don't think until now there was uh, much attention put into this. Uh, so having report who actually capture those uh, experiences, those faults, those uh, uh, those problems is uh, is really important. So that's uh, uh, that's really a great achievement. Um, we hope that uh, thanks to this report, uh, we can ac actually at least uh, start the conversation uh, uh, about the situation. Uh, uh, it's also important from community's point of view and audience's point of view. As uh, Sarah mentioned, there is 3.7% of, of population are Central and Eastern Europeans. In other numbers, we know that there is about 3 million of Europeans here and uh, second spoken language in this country is Polish, for instance, but we don't really feel that we have our space here. Um, uh, Eastern European migrants very often um, report this uh, sense of isolation, of marginalization. Um, I think that having the cultural presence in the public life is this ultimate um, um, uh, sign of uh, uh, integration and uh, acceptance of, uh, of the newcomers. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the um, negative stereotypes follows the, uh, 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 the arts and culture where Eastern Europeans are reduced to, to, to people working in the low and uh, low paid end of the industries like uh, there is a strong stereotype of Eastern Europeans as just uh, being uh, fruit uh, pickers or cleaners or uh, hospitality workers. So um, uh, not seeing uh, our culture, our art, our films in the, in the programming, in the festivals really uh, uh, perpetuate this feeling. Um, so I think this change would be very much welcome from, from integration and migration point of view. Uh, another thing, uh, what uh, this report uh, uh, is doing is bringing more attention to xenoracism and the concept of otherness. Uh, 
uh, it shows how uh, being other is really difficult and still not accepted. Uh, there is a lot of uh, conversation, discussions about diversity, about uh, um, uh, minorities, but very often is only defined in terms of the skin color. Uh, I think uh, uh, there, there is a lot achieved anyway, and there is uh, I, I really appreciate what's, uh, uh, all the efforts and, uh, and the public discourse out there, but uh, sometimes there is a feeling that uh, diversity only means uh, someone who is non-white. And when we look into the categorization of diversity, which most institutions and organizations just simply follow the, the government guidelines where there is a list of the 16 uh, ethnicities, and when we cannot find ourselves on it, uh, uh, it means we're not diverse, we're not ethnic, we don't really belong to the uh, to the groups which which gets uh, sit at the table when diversity is being discussed, or we don't, you know, or getting opportunities where there is, you know, advertisement for, uh, for instance, being an artist or uh, calls or uh, even job adverts. So we've seen over the years a number of people being rejected when they apply for those opportunities, being told that you, you, you don't diverse enough or uh, uh, using other, other excuses. Uh, so, I think uh, um, I think this this report uh, um, uh, brings this uh, conversation and uh, tries to focus on uh, seeing how people are being othered, um, not simply by the color of their skins or defined by government uh, ethnicity. Um, um, another thing, uh, and I think maybe the most important. Um, uh, the point is, is actually uh, the reflection of how this diversity is defined. The report mentioned uh, giving example of, for instance, Arts Council, which uh, published a diversity strategy uh, about a year ago, and which is very ambitious, very great, is very open. There is a lot of amazing points, but, but then when we look back, uh, we cannot really see how uh, ethnicity, white ethnicity would fall into it. And it's really sad to see that uh, the skin color is determinant here uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to determine who is minority, who is ethnic, who is diverse, who, who belongs to this group, which needs a little bit more support and, uh, uh, and um, additional inclusion uh, work. So, uh, uh, there is a hope, maybe small, uh, that we can uh, look a little bit wider how we define people and how we define who uh, um, uh, who is uh, uh, in diversity. I think quite uh, recently, uh, Black Lives Matter movement also showed how the greater is the satisfaction with uh, with uh, with the diversity tick box system. Uh, so maybe the, maybe with the more initiatives and more conversation like this which uh, we, which will lead to the uh, to the greater review um review of the situation but uh, but for now i think there is uh, this report hopefully will at least bring attention to to the situation of eastern europeans and the experience of um uh, xenophobia and racism on a uh, almost daily basis uh, things like um racist incidents happen not only in uh, in culture and work and uh, it's uh, also happening to people in their in their private life is affecting almost everyone um so that's uh, that's i think the main uh, message uh, uh, we wanna uh, we wanna pass hopefully uh we will be able to avoid situation like uh, with uh, for instance arts council where centrala is funded actually as uh uh, diverse organization. Uh, we are uh, fall under the creative case for diversity, but when we report back to the Arts Council, we cannot really say we have, for instance, diverse board or diverse management, even though everyone, uh, almost 99% of uh, our staff are, are migrants, <laughs> we cannot really report back that uh, we support and we employ diverse people. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, but we are funded to promote Eastern European Eastern European art. So I think um, that's that's in a nutshell. The report is great and highlights uh, a lot of issues. Uh, it's focused on uh, Midlands, um, 
uh, gives a little bit of picture. Uh, hopefully, maybe one day we can uh, we can do similar report, uh, which will cover the whole of the country. But we can pretty much assume that situation is quite similar everywhere. Our interview is in the report. Uh, came from different loca location in the UK, so so it's quite um, important to remember. And I just uh, to just finish off, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, there is uh, uh, more discussion happening about uh, role in uh, of the migrants in culture. There is uh, quite recent uh, initiatives uh, like migrants in culture who the the organization which is based in London and quite recently uh, migrants in the theater and there have been launched in uh, migrants uh, in the theater in Midlands so there is more voices trying to amplify uh, uh, the situation uh, of migrants who uh, are often people uh, new in the country uh, regardless of the skill or, or the origin but it's it is really hard to start the new life uh, in the um, uh, in the new country uh, uh, where qualifications are not recognized education is not recognized people do not have pre-existing networks or uh, uh, it's sometimes it's even uh, difficult to understand the system the um, creative economy itself and and how people people operate. So there is this wider now call to look into the migrant and migrancy as, as a factor, which also needs uh, additional support uh, and needs to be uh, considered when uh, designing opportunities. So I think that's uh, all from me now and hopefully there will be more opportunity to discuss it in the question sections. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Uh, that was very interesting. So I, I see that we already have some questions and I hope they will be coming and we will be able to, you know, follow up of, on um, what you, you've just talked about uh, later on. And um, now I would like to introduce uh, Professor Louise Ryan. So um, if I could get Louise, yes, and <laughs> unmute yourself, thank you. So um, Louise is a senior professor at London Metropolitan University. And she's a director um, of the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Center. And this is a research center. There is a home for interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary scholarship and explores migration, uh, diasporas, nations, um, regions, localities, all through the lenses of diversity and inequality. Now, Louise has been working um, on migration for almost 20 years. She is the expert on um, um, Irish and Polish migration. Um, she did a lot of work about women migrants. Um, in 2015, she was awarded um, with a fellowship of the Academy of um, Social Sciences for her contribution to migration research. And she is a leading expert on uh, qualitative social network analysis as well. She is widely published, widely cited. And um, so, so yes, let's welcome her. Um, let's welcome her today. Thanks very much, Kinga. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you to Sarah as well for that really fascinating presentation and, and for the report, which I had the pleasure of reading and, and found to be so thought provoking. So I'm not going to talk for very long um, because I can see questions are, are gathering, but I just wanted to highlight a few key points that, that hopefully will be relevant to help us to sort of take the discussion forward. So the first thing that I wanted to remark upon was the kind of way in which this topic is being approached through an intersectional lens and the necessity to adopt an, inter an intersectional perspective in understanding the, the different characteristics that come into play here. Class was mentioned quite a lot in the report and in Sarah's presentation. And I think when we talk about the arts in this country, you can't ignore the relevance of class because it does tend to be very middle class and indeed upper class dominated. And I think even for British people from working class backgrounds, it's quite hard to break in to the kind of culture industry, if we can use that word, the culture sector. And the other issue that really came through in the report as well was about gender and the gendering of kind of cultural representation, cultural stereotypes, the performance of culture through these kinds of gendered images. And I was very struck by that quote 
about the actress who was then sort of surprisingly described as, oh, she's not a cleaner, she's an actress, and how women migrants very much are confronted by these kinds of stereotypes, gendered stereotypes, uh, which can be um, patronizing, but, but can also be very disempowering and discriminatory. So I really liked that aspect of the report in bringing class and gender uh, to the fore but also whiteness and white ethnicity. And as Kinga said, I've been researching white migrants, white European migrants for almost 20 years now. And to, to look at the positionality and the shifting positionality of, of white migrants who now make up the majority of, of migrants um, in this country, because as we know, of course, many of the ethnic minority population were born here. So they are British born as opposed to, to being migrants themselves. And, and that's an important distinction, I think. But it's also interesting to reflect on that kind of visibility and invisibility of whiteness and how European migrants were in many respects invisible. But of course, what Brexit did was it really heightened the visibility of, of white European migrants in a way that hadn't been done before for many white Europeans, particularly Western European migrants who'd lived kind of under the radar in Britain. I'm, I did a research project on French highly skilled migrants in London. And really until Brexit, they were a very invisible group. They lived under the radar and, and Brexit suddenly exposed the, the prevalence of three million plus European migrants living in Britain. Of course, for Eastern European migrants, particularly Polish migrants in particular, I would say, uh, they had never really been invisible. They'd never been under the radar since 2004. Uh, there'd been a lot of focus on migrants coming from Eastern Europe and Central Europe to Britain after EU accession. But nonetheless, we do see that kind of shifting scale of visibility and invisibility and that came through very nicely in the report, I thought. The other thing, um, as Kinga mentioned, I, most of my research is on networks. I, I do a lot of network analysis with migrants and mapping their networks. And the theme of networks and social capital is very well demonstrated in the report as well, particularly the role of networks in the arts sector. Unlike other sectors where there might be at least um, an attempt at um, equal opportunities, open um, advertising of recruitment processes and so forth, I think it's fair to say that in the arts broadly defined, social networks really are hugely influential in terms of it's often the kinds of connections you have, the kinds of opportunities that you get through meeting particular influential people who can open doors for you. So it is very often about who you know. And clearly for migrants, I'm a migrant myself. I, I wasn't born in this country. But when you arrive, you don't have those kinds of social connections. And it can be very disempowering, particularly in a sector like the arts where networks are so important. And that links to the related theme of cultural capital. And what I really liked about the report is it highlighted the, the difficulties in transporting cultural capital, because it's often assumed in the literature that if you have cultural capital, you can sort of take it around with you as a migrant, particularly a highly qualified or highly experienced migrant, that you kind of bring your cultural capital around with you. And we know that that's a really a gross simplification because there's often a kind of a place specificity to cultural capital. The value of particular expertise and experience and qualifications are often rooted in particular places and they don't carry the same kind of status or recognition when you try to carry them to another geographical location, to another country in the case of migrants. So the way in which people's skills, expertise, qualifications are downgraded, undervalued, not understood, not appreciated when they become migrants in a new country. That also was a very strong theme I felt emerging from the report. One of the things that I would though maybe want us to discuss and question is the role of categories and how do we define people into categories. The census was mentioned and funnily enough just yesterday I got my letter about the census warning me that I must complete the census and if I don't there's a £1,000 fine. So the new census is coming but for now we are still reliant on the 2001 census and as we know that the white other category is, is a 
very generic category. It's a really unhelpful category for those people like me who do migration research. Uh, that white other category is pretty useless because it just doesn't give you any information unless you can then extrapolate to country of birth to try to pull out some meaningful data through that category. But there is then a bigger issue about how do we wish to categorize people? And I noticed in the report, the Central and Eastern European, so CEE uh, category is mentioned quite a lot. And I can understand that there might be some kind of political merit or value in having a shared category, which brings people together so they can share their experiences and create solidarities, particularly in terms of lobbying or bringing about some kind of political change and, and arguing for recognition as a group, as a collective group. But is that a really meaningful collective group? Because within that group, we have some very, very varied nationalities and ethnicities. For example, previous research has been done on the difference between Romanians and Hungarians, often very, very different experiences in Britain, very different life chances in Britain. The difference between, for example, somebody from Estonia and somebody from Poland, you know, these are very diverse categories. And I can see in the chat, somebody's already raised the issue of Roma and to what extent their experiences would be reflected in a generalized category of Central and Eastern European migrants. So while we are critical, rightly critical of the white other category, I would just urge some caution in then how we construct other categories, which might be equally um, flawed and also uh, risk generalizing across people who are very different and have very different experiences, different life chances um, in this country as migrants. So that's one issue I think we, we might want to discuss. But I think the final point I'll make, uh, which I really valued with the report, was the way in which participants talked about the expectations on how they performed their culture, that they were often confronted with cultural stereotypes about, oh, okay, now you're going to perform some aspect of Polish culture, and people had a preconceived idea about what that would be like, whether that would be folk dancing or something that people would see as quite traditional, and that this was then a kind of constraint on the ways in which artists sought to perhaps present very different kinds of cultural expressions. And I was uh, thinking about that um, and reflecting on a television program I saw last night, purely by chance. I am not a big fan of the Hairy Bikers, but some of you may be familiar with the Hairy Bikers. There are a couple of guys from the northeast of England who are cooks and who travel around the country on motorbikes cooking. Well, in yesterday's episode, purely by coincidence, they were in Poland. And right at the end of the program, they were cooking um, meat in a forest. Um, they'd been looking at the bison. And they were then joined by a Polish cultural group. And it was exactly the kind of cultural group discussed in the report. Elderly women wearing traditional Polish dress and singing, standing in the countryside. And it was just, it made me smile in a way, although it is quite a, a damaging stereotype because exactly as was discussed in the report was on television on the BBC last night as an example of Polish culture. So that just goes to show how the report is really um, has its finger on the pulse in terms of the challenges that artists face in being able to express different aspects of culture and not being shoehorned into very ethnicized stereotypes about different kinds of cultural representations. So on that point, I'll stop. But thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and I thoroughly enjoyed the report. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, that was very interesting. And, um, and now I would like to introduce Pauline uh, de Souza, who is a, a director of the Diversity Art Forum and a senior lecturer at, um, in the Visual Arts Department at the University of East London. Um, Pauline is a paid liaison representative for Tate British uh, Art Network and uh, sits on the Tate British Art Network uh, steering group. 
So she's also involved with the um, Arts Council and the Philanthropy Department. Um, uh, she's engaging with the Beacon Collective, Black Art uh, Funding, and other philanthropists um, supporting the arts. So she has yet a different uh, perspective than, than the previous panelists. So Pauline, if I can now. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Kinda. It's um, I'm very much in. Maybe I should go full screen if I can go full screen. Where do I go full screen? Uh, I can't go full screen. I guess I can go to view. Okay, full screen gallery. Full screen. So, mm. Okay. Oh, I can't go full screen. I can't do that. Okay. Can you still hear me? Anyway, uh, I can. I can. I, I can see. Yes, we can see you, and okay. so we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Great. So I was very interested to hear what the other panelists had to say about the report, and um, it's interesting because some of the comments was what I was going to refer to as well. So I'm um, I'm glad to actually hear that those comments have been picked up. But one of the things that really strikes me about the report was the issue around diversity and the understanding about fame or what that might mean as well. And um, I not only do I sit with the Arts Council working with visual arts, I also sit on the Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Committee at University of East London. So I'm fully involved in, in, in the policy and what happens across the university as well. So we've already been having these discussions about whiteness and what it means to be white. And I've already been talking to my fellow um, colleagues on that panel about the issues around migration and people coming from Central Europe and Eastern Europe, because we have those in our student cohort. And I felt that our policies weren't really taking those issues on board. So that's from the UEL perspective. But outside that, um, the idea about whiteness and white privilege has always been a problem for me, um, understood from the Arts Council perspective, the government perspective, and also from, uh, should I say, the BAME, people of colour, perspective as well, because I'm fully aware that there is an element of unconscious bias coming from the BAME group. I don't like that word BAME, and people know I don't like that word BAME, but there is an unconscious bias towards whiteness. And unfortunately, that unconscious bias does mean that people coming from Central Europe, or at least in Europe, are categorised in that whiteness and the white other, whether you were born here, not born here. It also made me think about the whole issue around whiteness and Irish whiteness and the whole kind of colonial aspect between Ireland and Scotland, England, which is playing itself out now because of Brexit and also because of COVID as well. And it, it made me more conscious about the unconscious bias by the BAME group towards white Irish and white Scottish, because that also had a kind of colonial racist anti-understanding context. And this report really made me think about that. And one of the things that I've been doing in relation to the Tate British Art Network is really open up that notion about Britishness. And one of the things that I have put in place with the Tate is to actually challenge that and to bring in a, um, a discussion about whiteness. And we've got now emerging creators group where we've had actually brought in people from the Middle East, well, from Middle East, from well, some people from the Middle East, but also people from Central Europe and from Eastern Europe to be part of this network and, and to have those opportunities to work and develop as a creator in the create Emerging Creators Group, which we're doing now. And that is a year program where they get funding and I'm responsible for, along with two other people, to make sure that they do those projects and the Tate complies to our new regulations to ensure that that aspect of the Tate is fully developed and resourced and funded for people who have been invited to be part of that network system and to promote their careers as well. Separate from that, um, as an organisation using the word diversity, it was really important for me that my organisation didn't use the categories from the Arts Council, didn't use the categories from the government, because that's not what we were about at all. And if you look at Diversity Art Forms website, you'll see that the way we think about diversity is very, very broad, and it doesn't necessarily depend on people's um, skin colour. It's more about processes and um, countries and internationalism as well as nationalism, localism as well as globalism as well. So our, our way of thinking about diversity is very flexible and, and changes all the time, it depends on who we're working and what we want to do and who we want to support as well. Separate from that, um, I also sit on the um, two cross-party, three cross-party forums, but two are quite relevant here, um, Department for Education and um, Department for Media, which is, involves culture as well. And it's quite clear to me there's a big issue 
a real big issue which hasn't been discussed in the cross-party forums. Um, I'm, when I'm saying cross-party forums, I'm talking about government cross-party forums, in, and that's all the political parties in government, or uh, in parliament, I should say, not government, parliament. And we have not yet discussed the issue around qualification and understanding qualification from people coming in as migrants or seem to be migrants. And that is a really, really big problem because the Department of Trade, Department of Education, Department of Culture has a major impact on what happens relating to education in this country and what happens relating to the Arts Council, how the Arts Council defines itself, defines its funding, how it engages with funding, how it engages with national portfolios. And those are really, really important issues that we need to think about. So when I was reading the recommendations as they were coming up, thinking, oh yes, that's really important, but you really need to get to the heart of of Parliament to really understand how you're going to get those policies and get that and get those things impacted to make that change. And I'm all up for helping to do that because I think it's really, really important that these issues around whiteness and migration are taken are really seriously taken into account and really, really do actually have an impact on how culture and diversity is important to this country. So I'm, that's where I'm going to end. Thank you, Pauline. Um, I see that we have many uh, questions in a question box. Um, and I wonder, um, Sarah, I can see two questions um, that are for you. So I wonder if you would like to maybe start and, and answer those. Um, shall, I, um, shall I read them? Yeah, I'm not sure that everyone can see the Q&A. So if you, can, if you read them, and also so that I know which, what questions you'd like me to answer, that would be, that would be great. Yes, so there was um, the first question, the, there is a first question um, for you, Sarah, about um, actually the practicalities of, you know, of sort of real life. Uh, Alexandra here says, um, a lot of creative and cultural workers need to be hospitality workers and cleaners as well in order to survive. So uh, taking into account the precarity of creative and cultural workers in the UK, and not only UK, what are the implications of demanding greater inclusion of CC migrants as um, CCW? Um, so she says, I'm being provocative, but isn't this like demanding integration into a burning uh, house? Um, yeah, no, that's uh, an interesting point. Um, uh, an important one, I think, I mean, I'd, firstly, yes, I agree. I mean, in, not, in art, as in academia, precarity is, is an, an enormous issue um, across the board and, and um, for, for everyone, but it's also an equality issue um, in academia, which is the word I, I know more in terms of job structures. Um, it becomes a question of who has the financial means to hang on long enough um, in order to get that more stable position. Um, so it becomes a question of class and equality and all of those kind of intersections as well. Um, I think that there is something specific about um, the migrant communities and perhaps particularly the Eastern European migrant communities that we're talking about. Um, uh, part of it is is the kind of need to take on to downscale um, on arrival um, and to take up low paid and precarious employment contributes to the perception, the stereotype of the low skilled Central and Eastern European migrant. Um, so that kind of feeds the xeno racism um, that these that people are experiencing. Um, and also in some contexts, so many of the, the interviewees um, had had years of high level qualifications and experiences in their countries of origin. Um, so they've been working as um, fully full time employed curators uh, for a number of years before coming to the UK. And that experience is just not recognised or not always recognised in the UK or those qualifications aren't recognised. And I think that's also an important difference. Um, compared to those who um, are British born, who yes, also experience precarity in the arts. Um, and, and that's not to deny that that's, that's, that's also a, a real issue um, that needs to be thought through. There is, um, there is another question for you, I see here. Um, and that one is about um, recommendations to decolonize UK arts. So how would you, the question is, how would you describe it to the black community at this moment in time? Um, yes, yeah, so I think it's important that that is explained in the way that we're using the term. Um, so I'm thinking about um, coloniality as a kind of worldview 
um, and colonialism structured the geography of the world in a particular way and you had um, the kind of the core, um, the Western core and then Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe um, as a semi-periphery and then other geographies as, as the periphery. Um, and um, decolonizing in that context would not be about doing it in order to particularly favor Central and Eastern Europe migrants, it would be to break down um, those structures. So it would, would, the idea would be that it would be for the, for the benefit of everyone to have a, a more inclusive or more diverse art scene. Um, so if, we looked, if you look at the chart that, um, that was in my presentation, you can see, as I said, that Central and Eastern European migrants find themselves in a position in between. Um, so they, there's far less representation than uh, Western European migrants and North American migrants, um, also not necessarily migrants, um, North American art and artists and Western European art and artists, um, but more than art and artists from other parts of the world. Um, so you see that kind of colonial structuring of the world with this West as the center and the Eastern European as the semi-periphery um, and other locations as the periphery in that art scene. And the idea would be to decolonize that um, in order to promote art and artists and from, on an equal basis from, from across the world. Yeah. And there was, um, there was another question about uh, what Louise mentioned. There was a question about, um, about the Roma. I don't know if any of the panelists would like to um, sort of- that was, I mean, that was specifically about whether we considered um, yeah. Roma artists. Um, so I'd say we, we didn't consider um, them as a separate category. Um, if, it, if they were Roma artists with um, country of birth or nationality in one of the Central and Eastern European countries, then they would have been included in our data, but they weren't included uh, separately in our data. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if Louise wants to comment on um, that separately. Um, Okay, uh, there are, there's also a question about social background and again about the intersections and, um, and I think that uh, what you mentioned Sarah was that and what Alicia mentioned as well that, well actually everyone uh, mentioned that um, one of the recommendations would be also to include uh, some intersectionality um, into all those um, categorizations. So there's one question about that exactly about the migrant status and identity and um, again, the cultural sector being dominated by more privileged members of society. And this is, I think, what Louise mentioned, but maybe um, there is something else to add about that. Can I say something here if that's possible? Yes. Of yeah, yeah, okay. Because um, one of the things, I mean, the intersection aspect is really, really interesting. And looking at the report, talking about privilege is really interesting as well. But one thing that the report doesn't quite touch on, which um, can be an unfortunate assumption, if, if you're going to be thinking about redefining the BAME category to put other people into that category, you have to also understand that in relation to the class structure in England, there is a black middle class that's also now becoming part of the culture in relation to diversity and inclusion as well. And for a long time, um, there, there has been this assumption, um, which I picked up in the report, that anyone who was in the BAME category was instantly, automatically working class. And there was a lack of understanding that even though people were coming from the Caribbean, that they were coming to the Caribbean because they were trying to find a better life, not understanding that the people from the Caribbean and also from India had actually um, professional skills and they were coming to the country to develop their, those special skills and also to be part of the mother country as well. And I think it's really important, um, Louise really made that point, you know, about categorization and um, becoming together as, as a group to lobby, which is really important, but you also got to understand that the differences in the group, if you're gonna to come together and acknowledge those differences while you're lobbying as well, to ensure that you're not kind of stuck in one kind of sectionality, which will be an unfortunate assumption, which maybe might lead to the recommendations that you want, then will take you another, uh, say 10 years, 15 years to change those recommendations because the wrong assumption has been made about essential Europe and artists coming from Eastern Europe as well. So you have to be really, really careful. Can I add something as well? 
um, uh, just on, on this topic. I just wanted to clarify when we said the recommendation is uh, to review BME, BAME categories, we're not saying we want to be added to them at all. That's, uh, I think maybe we should make it very clear. Uh, I think uh, we call this to review of all categories and let's look at the system again. And uh, what we want is like, let's, let's just consider, let's just maybe scrap it and start again because this system, I don't even know, it was designed way before I arrived to this country and I don't know how it worked before. Maybe it worked for BME, but from my perspective and many other people's perspective, uh, it doesn't work at the moment. And uh, I can see in chat there is also the question about white privilege and how this call would uh, affect uh, white privilege is very close related. Uh, but I think it's, I think what, uh, what, we, what we are trying to say here is, uh, we need to look why because we 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 trying to bring attention that white people also can be discriminated and experience racism is not always about the skin color it's about other features characteristics and background so i think it's important that uh, that it is noticed and uh, and also that the system as it is now is not working and uh, what we want to what we uh, want to achieve is that you know the open society when everyone who is other is just accepted and there is so many forms of otherness not just uh, you know diversity in un understanding of you know the color skin color but also is like you know, sexual minorities there is uh, gender there is so many different things and if we have this pol 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 policy of categorizing people and defining who can be ethnic and who can be diverse and who cannot. I don't think we can achieve that, and and I don't think I don't understand the question about how would we explain it to the uh, black community at this point. But I think, I think we just want all want the same. We want to live in a society when everyone is open and and uh, and equal. And uh, just because someone will get something a little bit more equality or rise, it doesn't mean that someone else will have less. And uh, uh, and I think nobody will ever win with, if we continue advocating uh, only for one group, because my, one group might one day win and, you know, have achieved the equality, but what about others? And then you might, you know, um, uh, you might start family or you might start working with someone who comes from completely different background and then you discover that, oh, okay, my group is now it's quite fairly okay, but what about them? And, uh, and uh, uh, I think we need to realize that uh, that, that uh, we, we just have to reduce all the barriers and um, um, yeah. there is no very easy answers how to do it, but at least we need to start looking again into those, uh, uh, into these BME categories and tick boxes. I totally agree. I totally agree with what you're saying and I don't like tick boxes either. And um, that question about how do you explain it to the black community, there's no such thing as a black community because the black community doesn't exist. There are communities with people just having to be black skin or brown skin or light skin. And there are people having to be a mixed race who belong to different kind of communities. So we shouldn't be worrying about how do we explain something to the black community. Basically what we should be talking about is how do we support each other as our organisations, as artists, to ensure that any kind of funding is available for everyone. And I totally agree with that. Yes, there are there are many questions here again i think that you probably answered most of them about um, again about these categorizations can i just and, take a think about the class question kinga uh sorry the, the class question that was um asked earlier um i think just to i think support what pauline was saying um that, that the question of of class and how that intersects um Oh yes, is, yes, um, there is. Um, yes, so there is a question. Yeah, there's about, not. An, we're not. There's not an assumption. Or a, I hope in the report that um, yeah. Central and Eastern Europeans are somehow per se not middle class, um, because I think class is maybe situated as well, um, and certainly class is constructed very differently in post-socialist context because class was constructed very differently under socialism as well. Um, so I think the. Um, in the same way that the Central and Eastern Europeans experienced themselves as white when they moved to the UK in a way that they perhaps didn't when they were living in Central and Eastern Europe, or, you know, let's say in Poland. Um, there's also that downskilling um, and kind of assumptions, stereotypical assumptions about migrants from the region that means that they, they, they find themselves um, classed as well um, in, in a way that, that, that perhaps doesn't reflect their experiences in their countries of origin. Hmm. There is a there is a question about um, oh for Pauline I see um, 
Yes, if there is no black community, how would you define Black Lives Matter movement? Uh -huh. I knew that's going to come up. <laughs> yes, the Black Lives Matter um, movement is consists of black communities. It's not a black community. It's black communities. It's a mixture of people coming from different communities to come together to lobby the situation and highlight the situation for people who feel discriminated because of their skin color. But it's not one community. You have African Africans there. You have African African Americans. You have Cubans who who are born in Africa who moved to America. Um, and that also includes my own family who, who, were, who were in America. That also includes my family, myself in London. So we, we come from different communities and we came together uh, uh, globally to raise the issue around racism and to come together to challenge the issue around racism as black communities, but under one umbrella. Sorry, someone here asks about um, fair recruitment. Uh, let me see. How can we achieve a fair recruitment in the creative industri industries and art um, institutions? At the moment, you know, I'm I'm kind of hopeful. I'm kind of hopeful that COVID is really going to bring a global change because, and as well as Black Lives Matter, Me Too Matter, the various movements that kind of make um, an impact about change. I'm kind of hoping that with all this kind of um, challenge to the system is that things will move forward. Um, I'm only a, an organisation who does actually have, yeah, I would say I'm privileged. I do have the power to make things happen. And, and I do have the power where people do actually listen to what I say and make sure things do uh, are implemented. So, and there are other people like me as well. Um, they might have our different attentions and we might have the same attentions, but I'm hoping that we can move forward to some kind of fair system that will be available for everyone. That is my intention. It's gonna be a hard work. I know it's gonna be a long, hard work, but I'm up for it and that's what I'm doing now. There is a question for Alicia, um, again, about concrete steep steps that you would like to see the uh, Arts Council uh, to take. So um, I think, again, this is this is again about, you know, um, what, what Louise was talking about. So what would be the ideal way of actually categorizing um, those groups and um, what the approach to diversity um, policies would be would be ideal or, or expected. So the question is, what would you like um, the art council to do first? And um, if they were to change their policies like today, what do you think would be the ideal outcome? Um, I think, um, as I said before, um, uh, I, should, I, I think uh, Arts Council uh, could uh, review the categories uh, a little bit wider, but uh, in the first instance, uh, I would like to see um, Eastern Europeans uh, also be seen as diverse and depending what diversity means, but I, uh, I think that um, the groups which uh, experience, uh, you know, xenoracism on, on, on a daily basis and uh, also have another label of a migrant, which is uh, uh, not protected characteristic, but there is very clear uh, hostility toward migrants and uh, uh, which uh, if you want to change it, uh, we need to do it uh, uh, actively. So uh, I would like uh, Arts Council to acknowledge the fact that not only those kind of already defined um, uh, uh, groups of people are um, uh, uh, minority and uh, need um, uh, uh, ex um, you know extra uh, support. Um, uh, in, in the in the programming and and the representation, but uh, I would yeah if uh, uh, if we were ask uh, uh, arts council directly, uh, we would like to first of all uh, uh, widen what they see as diverse. Uh, I think uh, review how they describe people and the groups of people in terms of uh, of the diversity and and the, mm -hmm. and the plans of for the future. I think it, it can be very misleading to just assume uh, that. Um, uh, someone who is white uh, 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 belong to the same category like uh, uh, sorry I'm just <laughs> not making myself clear. 
it's just uh, it's just the uh, the basic understanding that, uh, for instance, someone who come from uh, from Eastern Europe, uh, countries like Poland, but you know even further, you know Ukraine or Belarus, um, uh, Armenia, uh, with uh, very different background, uh, who come here to this country, uh, find very difficult way of uh, restarting new life. The perception of of people coming from this country is very different. Like, for instance, an artist coming from New York here, or the artist coming from Paris and starting a, a new life here. We we don't have the same experiences. We don't have the same opportunities. And deciding that if you're white, you are okay, and we can just call you any other white and be fine is really misleading and is not enough. Uh, that includes the same. Um, uh, it's the, the discussion is also about uh, Jewish. Uh, 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 communities and the same for instance when you look I don't know Irish traveler community so you know the whiteness has uh, uh, many different uh, aspects and I think uh, it's uh, it's too easy just to assume you white you fine and uh, not to mention that there is uh, um, there is nuances even with this because obviously we discuss here uh, we're trying to show the perspective of Eastern Europe so it means when if you are Eastern Europeans, it can look like this, that you apply for a job, uh, art sector or not art sector, or you apply for res artist residency or, uh, or exhibition. Very often when people see, oh, you have this, you know, difficult to pronounce Polish name or some other name, uh, you graduated from university in Krakow, Bucharest, and your experiences working in uh, some kind of Ukrainian art gallery, you're very likely to be rejected. And you might happen to not be white because we're not even talking about uh, this layer here, but people are being rejected and uh, uh, excluded just for this, uh, for, uh, for, from this set of information. So, uh, so the exclusion is very, is very much uh, more complicated uh, than just categorizing people into white and non-white and uh, uh, and uh, I don't even think I don't uh, I don't believe that you know just adding another category for Eastern European is a solution uh, because yeah. it's not because there are so many other people who are still not fitting those boxes so we so the only thing I would say to our at council is you either create box for everyone or there is no boxes at all and there is some kind of other system so uh, I think I, I think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, none, none of the solution is very easy. So I think with the Arts Council is, is let's talk, let's start reviewing things, let's start open up discussion, do some mm -hmm. consultation and start the process and see, uh, so he, uh, see how we uh, can replace the system. There are other uh, in European countries uh, which they don't use this categorization. Uh, maybe there are some examples to, to choose from, but, but what we are calling here is just really to open up a discussion. Yes, I would like to, um, there are more questions, sorry, there are more questions about the roles of uh, cultural institutions, but before that I would like to follow up maybe on uh, Alicia just said, and I would like to ask Louise, um, do you think that there is something you know that we can learn from other uh, white other communities that you studied and maybe um, you know, in relation to the inclusion policies and measures and um, how these lessons can be actually applied maybe to um, the Central and Eastern European artist communities. Because I mean, that's been all sort of, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it's, I'm sure you, you've seen uh, similar things happening before with other communities you studied. So there, I just think maybe there are some measures that been already uh, worked out? Well, I mean, the only other group that I can talk about with any expertise is the Irish. And obviously, that's very specific because of that colonial historical relationship, as Pauline has already mentioned. So the Irish are included in the census. We are a recognized category, um, and we're one of the very few white categories that is explicitly named on the census as, as uh, white Irish which isn't without its problems as well, because not all Irish people are white, but anyway. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was a very hard fought for campaign to get the Irish included in the census. And it was driven by a very, very strong lobby from the voluntary sector community organizations who were looking at really hard markers of socioeconomic deprivation, 
very um, high levels of um, morbidity and mortality. Uh, so a real specificity of an argument about why the Irish should be included in the census. And of course, that deep legacy of anti-Irish racism in this country stemming from that colonial history. So I'm not sure that that example would be replicable to other groups. And, and I suppose this is the, the argument that would be made is that migrants coming from Eastern and Central European countries don't have that colonial relationship with Britain, which again is different to many of the other communities who've come here in large numbers before. So from that point of view, I'm not sure that's going to be any help to, to you, Kinga, but I think what's happened with the Irish as well is, is in terms of, of that struggle actually for visibility, because of course we had the added complexity of the IRA bombing campaigns and the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the whole kind of um, stigmatization around the sort of Irish terrorist. Before we had Islamic terrorists, we had Irish terrorists. And the Prevention of Terrorism Act in this country was developed for the Irish, not for the Muslims at all. So, you know, th there's so much there which is different and which does not apply thankfully, to the experiences of other migrant groups who are coming in who are also white. And that's what I'm saying about looking at those specificities and looking at those differences, that just putting people together in a group really masks the enormous differences in terms of their experiences and the historical legacy to try to understand why people have those experiences. Yeah. And, and I think what's so interesting about the post-2004 accession is that it's really the first time that you have this very large movement of a million plus people coming in in a very short space of time who have not had a previous colonial legacy and a previous colonial relationship with Britain. So unlike the Irish, unlike all the other groups who came in from the Caribbean and Africa and Asia and all the other groups, um, probably the one group that would fit into that category from an earlier period would be the Jewish refugees who came in in very large numbers from Eastern Europe in the 19th century and 20th century. So, you know, we're looking at a very new situation here, which is not entirely without precedent, but it is quite specific. So I think we're kind of learning as we go along post 2004. And now with Brexit, of course, it's all changed again. So this is why researching migration is endlessly fascinating, because it's a continually shifting sands. And it's I would say, because I do take a historical lens in my work, it's always important to look at the past and see, can we learn any lessons from the past that we're not continually reinventing the wheel? But I do feel that the situation we're looking at now has a number of very specific characteristics, which mean that it isn't always possible to replicate lessons from the past. Can I say something here? Because I think your point is really interesting and the other points are really interesting. That is why I mentioned the Department of Education, Department of Trade and Department of Culture, because we're looking at something that doesn't have a colonial or post-colonial history. We're looking at something that's really thinking about how this country interacts nationally in the global market. And that has an impact on education, that has an impact on trade, and that has an impact on culture. And you can talk to the Arts Council, but at the end of the day, the Arts Council has to get its money from the Treasury, which is very much involved in the parliamentary decisions about what happens to the Department of Education, what happens to the Department of Edu um, Culture, and what ha happens to the Department of Trade. So you really need to sort of look at the bigger picture to see what impacts need to happen in those areas to get the Arts Council to shift its direction and its focus. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it came came out very well in the report as well that this sort of lack of colonial link uh, makes CC communities sort of maybe not interesting enough, and they are sort of left in this leftover box. This was a very good quotation of a leftover box of being the white other, so still the other, but maybe not that interesting. And that's a question here as well about the role of cultural institutes. Uh, in changing the perspective on um, the CE art and artists. Um, what do you, would, would you expect the cultural institutes to, to do to change this sort of maybe caricatural or stereotypical way in which um, some cultures are portrayed? 
I think this is the right time to start really pushing those boundaries about cultural change, because at the moment, the cultural change due to Black Lives Matter and COVID is really focusing on diversity in relation to the BAME definition, in relation to gender, in relation to sexuality. And it's not really thinking about the idea of whiteness and white other as, as being a diverse group. And I think it's really important not to miss the opportunity to really start pushing those discussions to create a cultural change because the cultural change is happening already in relation to diversity with BAME, with sexuality and gender, because it has to, because again, those organisations that are part of the national portfolio, which was mentioned earlier, get, get the funding from the Arts Council. And you, it was mentioned earlier how the Arts Council is measuring their national portfolio organisations in relation to diversity. So um, it's really important to shift how the major cultural institutions are directed and um, coerced in a way, yeah, I'm using the word coerced, to think about difference of whiteness as part of that diverse community, but also the cultural institutions do rely on small grassroots organisations to open up, to engage, to represent and show them other art, other art groups, other art forms and other forms of engaging and they have those dialogues with the grassroots and it's the big organizations that get funded by the national, port the national portfolios who then feel they, are, they, they have to represent what's being shown to them or what they find themselves because they have to justify the funding from the Arts Council which who has to justify the funding from the Treasury which has to drive the funding from, from Parliament. So therefore, it's really, really important to understand how the system works. And I know in the report saying we don't know how the system works. The system is a very, very complicated system. It took me a long time to understand it, a long time to understand it. And I was only invited to be part of these parliamentary forums three years ago. Um, I did, I, it's not something I applied for. You, I got invited by the parliamentary forums to be involved because they knew what the diversity art forum was doing and they knew that we were different from the other organisations and they know that we were trying to and do make change. So that's what, And that's why I'm still involved in it. But it's really, really important that you understand the relationship between the grassroots and the big organisations and you need to start really pushing that dynamics to, to make change now and not wait 10 years later. Because I said earlier, if you wait 10 years later, it'll be too late and you'll be you're back to square one again. So you, it's important that, and you are doing it. You are having these um, discussions. It's really, really good. And um, one of the things I'm going to do is um, I'm going to talk to Helen Cooper, who is the director of the um, Arts Council Visual Arts Department. I'm going to talk to her about this, actually. And if you allow me to share this recording with her, I will. I want to share this recording with her because I think it's really, really important. And she's very much involved with um, Peter Haslick, who has been appointed by the government to actually look over the overall funding for the arts and culture department. So I have access to people who can actually start making change. So please use me and please allow me to use this funding to also start having conversations with the Arts Council, because I think it's really, really important. And I want to start those conversations now as well. Yeah. We will certainly be taking you up on that. Thank you. Definitely, that's really great, Colleen. Thank you so much. We have some. We have a question here from uh, actually an, an artist, an CE artist, who's saying, "I'm an artist and researcher myself. I'm, I've been considering to move on to postdoctoral studies, and I wonder which London-based institutions would be the best um, to address to start a conversation with. If I'm interested in addressing issues of and uh, the problem of migration." Um, so I don't know, maybe Alicia, maybe it's a question for you. I mean, what would you advise to, you know, aspiring young artists who want to launch their career in the UK and to, where should they go? Uh, but I think this is the question of postdoctoral studies uh, and where are the best opportunities? I'm not really so up to date with academic. Yeah. No, I was thinking. I was thinking from a sort of border border perspective. You know, if you have someone like a young artist who you know thinks about the career in the UK, is there anything that you can advise? Uh, because we talked before about you know this lack of networks very often, and um, actually um, you know lack of pre-established you know maybe uh, networks in some you know sort of more art establishment. So. 
maybe and um, i mean obviously we cannot really advise on 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 um on sort of a specific you know academic route but but um I think I can because I wear that academic hat oh, as well. So, oh, okay. But could you just make it quite clear and um, precisely what the question is before I actually answer? Yes, it? I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Um, wait a second. I'm trying to find it. Is the box just moving? Um, um, I think that I think Matt has moved it into the answered box. Oh, okay. No, no worries. Uh, I, I wonder at which London-based institution would be the best uh, address to start a conversation with if I'm interested in addressing issues of EEM in the UK. Yes. Uh, okay. Problem so, of migration and post-war EE refugees. Okay, so the best organization to start with will be the AN, which is the artist newsletter. That's an organization that, so has, that is really focusing on supporting artists. It's also connected to AWITA, which is the Association of Women in the Arts as well. And those organizations are very much concerned around the topics that you just mentioned in your question. So, and they are both London-based, um, but AWITA is London-based, AN is London-based, but has its network is national. AWITA's network is also national as well. So I would start there. And there's also um, Third Text, which has a kind of academic artist support network. And they in particular have a group that's focused on Central, Central European and Eastern European artists as well. So I hope that helps. In terms of uh, specific, uh, for instance, uh, organization supporting Eastern European artists or academics, so, so unfortunately we don't have uh, uh, many here. Um, uh, I think a very good starting point to explore those issues is uh, migrants in culture. They based in London. Uh, there is um, Polish migrants organized also based in London, and outside of London, that's that's us at Centrala, where we uh, we offer support, mentoring, and uh, networking opportunities for for the artists. Uh, it's not uh, happening. Uh, uh, that much in uh, during COVID and uh, with the Brexit uh, taking focus from from it, but unfortunately uh, uh, there is very uh, there is no opportunity uh, networking opportunities uh, saying for for uh, CE artists. That's uh, unfortunately there is no um, uh, not that many cultural organization. There is a little bit more happening in Scotland. There is few organization in Edinburgh, but but here in England um, uh, is not much. There's one other organisation I want to mention, um, which is called Procreate. Procreate also supports artists, but it supports female artists who are mothers. So I don't know if there are any artists who are mothers um, in the audience, but if you are and you want support, um, you should also um, look at Procreate, um, the Mother's Art House, which is really important. And they're based in London as well, but they also are starting to go more nationally. So that's another organisation to think about. Okay. Sorry, Alicia. Yeah, there is also an answer from, uh, from, uh, from a participant, Nella, uh, posted that uh, she's happy to have a chat as supervisor at the University of Arts London, uh, which just established post-colonialism and arts platform at UAL. There's a question from Alexandra from the Three Million Young European Networks. And um, she's asking um, to what extent see migrants themselves overall identify as an ethnic minority and in what circumstances. Uh, she says that from um, working with EU citizens in the third sector, she feels that there are mixed opinions on this and it would be fascinating to hear more on this. And again, she's asking about more about the BAME cat category. We, we did talk about it before, but I think that's a, it's a very interesting question she's asking in other fields such as politics, for example. So, um, because that's a political um, political issue as well. So, um, maybe, I don't know, Louise can... Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting point. When I did my research with the French, um, highly skilled in London, they absolutely did not see themselves as migrants. They very much rejected the term migrants and many of them even prefer the term ex expats. Um, so expatriates, uh, but they saw themselves as, as French people who happened to be living in London. And it was interesting actually, because they had a very London 
focus. So they saw themselves as being in London rather than being in Britain or in the UK. It was very much about being working and living in London. But when we went back and spoke to them again after the 2016 referendum, many of them said, I now think of myself as a migrant and I had never thought of myself as a migrant before. So I think Brexit was a game changer. And I'm sure people from the three million will have heard that narrative before. So there's definitely been that shift where particularly people, as I said earlier, from the kind of old European countries who'd been here for a long time and who had freedom of movement and all the rights associated with that didn't necessarily see themselves as migrants. But then that raises the other question, which I think is what the um, questioner was posing, is to what extent would they see themselves as, as an ethnic group or an ethnic minority? And I think that is, again, a big question because many people that I've spoken to would see themselves more through a nationality rather than a specific ethnicity. And certainly most of them would not see themselves as an ethnic minority. And even going back to the Irish, when there was that campaign to include the Irish as a category in the 2011 census, some Irish people were actually quite unsure about that and were a bit uncomfortable about the idea because they almost felt like it would be drawing attention to them rather than just allowing them to kind of live quietly in the background. So I think it is a mixed um, picture and I would be wary of just assuming that people would see themselves a as migrants and b as as people defined through an ethnic lens because i think as sarah was saying earlier um that might be quite an alien construct to people who come from a country where they maybe felt that it was quite a homogenous identity and and then to have this construction of an of an ethnicity might feel quite alien so i think we need to be careful in kind of throwing around these assumptions so it's quite a good question to get us thinking about it um i would say um from the interviews um that we did with the migrant artists that mostly they would not have considered themselves to be um part of the bame category at least um whether or not they would consider themselves to have a separate ethnicity is, or a white ethnicity is a different question but certainly when the discussion was around um, diversity monitoring, um, they didn't tend to perceive themselves as being part of that category. Yeah. And if we talk about underrepresentation, again, going back to underrepresentation, there is also um, a question about how can we compare and contrast um, the CE migrant experience in the arts and in the other fields when they are underrepresented, such as politics. Uh, if I might uh, make a start, um, uh, I think supporting uh, Eastern European migrants for over 10 years now, I can say from my experience that, uh, uh, that um, uh, the similar situation is in, in, in various different fields. Um, uh, people have a similar experience, experiences when um, I want to become an, uh, other professionals. Uh, and it's mainly down to the fact that uh, qualifications are not recognized. Uh, other thing is if we happen to have the, for instance, maybe education or qualification recognized is not valued. So if you don't graduate of British University, you are unlikely to get the job when the requirement is to have, you know, higher education diploma. You will always lose in competition with, with British diplomas. So that's regardless whether it's in arts or, uh, or, or in other fields. Um, and I think uh, the, uh, the only field which where I'm uh, where I notice quite high representation and high numbers of Eastern Europeans is academia, uh, where is almost every university will have uh, Eastern European researchers because you know I think due to the environment, uh, people actually recognize the in the value of of employing someone who's educated in Eastern Europe, but uh, but in in other fields, uh, employers didn't come to this realization that someone who comes from Eastern Europe actually can be well educated. So I think for people aspiring to have like, you know, higher professional jobs, it's, uh, um, it is very different. We see it very often, for instance, the, those glass ceiling where uh, years ago, uh, for instance, teaching professions, they, they made slightly easier uh, to translate the qualifications. But what we observe, uh, 
is that uh, people, because for instance, uh, in Poland, uh, teachers need to have master's degree. In UK, it's bachelor's degree. So when people come here already with a teaching experience, mm -hmm. teaching education, they go to the British schools and uh, they, they do get the job, but usually as a teaching assistant and they, and they remain. So we, we, it's very rarely, there's, uh, you know, it's, uh, um, it's very rarely when we actually meet an uh, Eastern European teacher who is actually a teacher or like head of department, that's rare, but we have masses of, uh, you know, master's degree level educated teachers on, on a teaching assistant role. There is a very interesting question here about, um, um, again, sort of tying up with what Luis said before. Um, about the sort of lack of discourse maybe of ethnicity and race um, sort of in Eastern Europe and, um, and about the position of white others in their home countries pre-migration. The question is sort of, um, those migrants were in a privileged position in Eastern Europe and with migration, someone saying they lament the loss in privilege. So, um how would you how would you sort of discuss discuss that because um as we've said you know uh, many people moved to the uk and they suddenly for the first time in their life they realized that they, they are white they never thought about this they never really uh, had to think about this and although obviously eastern europe is much more diverse and also even those countries that are seen as very homogenous like poland they also ethnically in a way diverse internally, which is very often forgotten about. There are very strong regional identities and there are diversities within the country. But um, this is a very different, again, because of the lack of the colonial link, that there is a very different sort of ideas about that. So there is not, not a discourse the same that's been in, in the UK. So this is a question about lack of, um, about lack of privilege um so i would like someone to to sort of maybe talk more about that because i think that um i think that the assumption of this idea that um cc migrants felt they were quite privileged in their home countries before and especially compared to the westerners and to the west countries it's a bit a bit of an assumption but it's an interesting question so it would be interesting actually to uh, to discuss this Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure I have an answer. Um, certainly the, the people that we interviewed um, were um, very reflective about their positionality. So there's, there's the, in the interviews, you can see um, lots of hesitation and reflection around, around various kinds of privileges that they, they acknowledge they have. Um, but I, I'm not sure that we can then generalize our interviewees mm. in, that, in that way in terms of how Central and Eastern European migrants might feel um, or might describe their experiences in the UK. Um, I'm not sure if maybe uh, Louise would have a better answer. I mean, I know there is some research around this, um, particularly done by John Fox, um, comparing Romanian and um, Hungarian discourses about their, their, their migration experiences. Yeah, I mean, it is a very complex and very varied picture about people's shifting positionality. And I wrote a paper many years ago, which I noticed is cited in the report. So thanks for that, uh, entitled Becoming Polish in London. And it's it is a phenomenon whereby people who move from a country where they are the majority to then become migrants in a country where they are a minority and particularly quite a visible and audible minority, how that really forces this kind of reflexivity about their positionality, about their identity, their culture, about how they sort of fit in a different society. And that can often be a shock because it, you can find that you are lower down the, the socio-economic um, order than you'd expect it to be. And of course, we know that a lot of migrants experience downward mobility, especially in the initial period after they first arrive where, as we've already said, people who have a master's degree can suddenly find themselves working in a cafe. And so it can really be a bit of a, a culture shock, but almost an, an existential crisis for some people where they, this was not what they expected would happen. And it really makes them think a lot about themselves and 
and sometimes there can be a sense of resentment as well because they feel I'm being treated really badly. Why am I being treated like this? How dare people treat me like this? So it, it can be really hard and it can really knock somebody's self-confidence and, and even have implications for their mental health. So I think we shouldn't underestimate that. And this again is one of the one of my critiques of the literature around freedom of movement and EU expansion, um, obviously all of this was before Brexit, that there was often a kind of assumption that it was very easy for migrants to move around Europe, that you had freedom of travel, freedom of mobility, and you could just get on a plane and move to another country and it was no problem. And it didn't really sufficiently recognize the differences, the cultural differences, the linguistic differences, the non-recognition of qualifications and the culture shock that people experienced when they moved. So I think that there was often, particularly in some parts of the academic literature, a celebration of mobility. There was a huge emphasis on mobility as if mobility was frictionless now because we were in this European Union with freedom of movement. And it really underestimated those kinds of shocks and the kind of impact it had on people who found themselves in quite alien situations where they were being downgraded and stigmatized and racialized, and it did come as a shock. So I think it's important to expose that aspect as well. Yeah, I, I, I hope that um, I hope that answers um, Alexandra's question here, uh, who was asking about the sense of privilege, you know, prior to the migration and actually before the contact with the other um, and finding ourselves in a position of, you know, of being of being migrants. Um, there was a question from um, Kasia Nalkovic here, Sarah, which I think maybe um, maybe you can answer. Um, I think that um, all those BAME, again, this is about BAME, BME categories, and I, and I think that uh, we did discuss that. So I'm not sure if there will be anything more, um, uh, more to ask, but again, uh, to add, but again, this is a question about white privilege and about um, the colonial history of the country. Yeah, so uh, how to make ourselves here visible without ignoring the white privilege. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really important point. I don't have an answer to the question. Um, I think it's important that the question is asked. Um, and, um, and as Alicia said, it's not it's not necessarily or probably not about us want us about um, Central and Eastern Europeans wanting to be um, included um, in the BAME category. It's about rethinking the categories, the boxes, um, and their their usefulness in general. And, and in the same in the same time, um, as as much as I agree, white privilege exists, but it's also very simplified terminology, which many people will uh, might argue whether they privilege because they're white. Uh, uh, as we've mentioned, I don't know Irish travelers, Jewish uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jewish community, uh, uh, some Eastern Europeans that are uh, you know people. Uh, I don't know, coming from uh, Eastern Ukraine, arriving as, uh, uh, as refugees here, and it's really difficult to point out to them, oh, you've got white privilege, uh, you know, you shouldn't uh, maybe take part in a conversation. So I would be also very, very careful, but I, I don't, I, but again, uh, it's, it's, it's about uh, trying to, to change the system as it is, uh, maybe not to add someone and take some something away. And I don't think um, if we would, uh, just because it, it, we would accept that some white communities are being excluded, it, it wouldn't dilute the, the whole white privilege, but also uh, we need to start talking a little bit more as a class because there is, uh, there is a very different, if you, if you are a New Yorker and, and have white privilege and, and you know, if, you rule in, if you live in kind of rural Moldova and your white privilege is, is still not the same. So I think it's, uh, 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 again, this risk about um, you know uh, you know putting a label on literally the whole kind of white group of people uh, because it's it's not always helpful. It it is in in some we I think uh, we always need to include context when we when we have those conversations and and really to all aim to uh, to change the change the system to be more inclusive and better for everyone. Yeah, the, the, someone asked, what about alliances between BAME and white others against the establishment? So could we develop some sort of united front 
against those policies of arts institutions? Do you think I'm that- I'm really for it. I'm, I'm really, yeah. we should all fight together and really change the system. And because, you know, it's, I don't think it's working for anyone at the moment. Yeah, it does seem that the system does not benefit anyone if you if you if you if you look at it and um, yeah I'm just looking at the the other one question one question I also I think it's interesting um, and maybe would be interesting to discuss is um, do you think that uh, you know the lives of those who move between countries uh, for their um, as part of their art related work will be affected by Brexit because uh, obviously the legal status of, of CE migrants changed and that will affect the arts exchanges and, and, and generally speaking, the way they sort of operate. I liked, um, there was one quotation from the artist that you was interviewed for this project. Um, one female artist said, um, I was secretly quite pleased, actually, maybe not pleased, but I thought with Brexit, maybe, maybe now they will notice us. Maybe now they will actually think there are all those Eastern Europeans here and maybe they will leave in five minutes. So maybe now we will be more visible. When, now when we are sort of in a more difficult legal situation, how do you think um, that will, uh, do you think that will happen? <laughs> Sarah. Um, it certainly hasn't worked out very well for modern languages departments so far. That hasn't happened. Um, I think uh, that we've talked about the um, the kind of perfect storm of um, existing centre racism being laid on top of Brexit, uh, which then um, positions Central and Eastern European migrants um, in uh, so it removes one of the privileges that they had, which was freedom of movement. Um, that privilege is gone, and and the, the need to for so many people to um, register to stay in their homes, um, and then the added layers of things like movement um, of artistic products and so on around Europe. Um, the reduction of funding for the cultural sector per se, um, which isn't which is going to mean more competition for even more scarce resources, um, and then of course um, COVID on top of that, um, which has um, stretched the um, arts and or the world of art and culture um, to the extreme um, because so many institutions have had to close their doors for so long um, and, and you know the government hasn't necessarily supported them as much as it might have done. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that helps. I think that that was a very dismal picture, uh, but no, I don't think Brexit is going to make anything better. No. I don't I don't think so either. Um, there is a question also about um, the sort of inner competition between the uh, CE migrants. And uh, because what you've been also talking about, and I think what's what also came out in the report is this sort of idea of limited resources and lots of group find, fighting for limited resources, for limited funding. And some of some feeling that they may be in a better position than the others, and trying to maximize their maximize their change their chances. So the question is about um, migrants with cultural work ambitions uh, turning against other uh, migrants who had maybe even less privilege than themselves. And I think that was very visible. Um, when Bulgaria and Romania was actually uh, joining the EU and many Poles who were already in the UK were saying, we don't want them to come, which was a strange thing to actually witness because most people actually assumed that, you know, we are sort of on the same side, but that was seen as a competition. So I think that's an interesting aspect as well. Um, what do you think about that? Well, just very briefly, because I'm, I'm conscious of time, but I, there is a, a kind of well-known phenomenon in migration studies of the, the sort of the people who get in last pull up the, the ladder behind them and they don't want anybody else coming in to kind of usurp their fragile position. And it is about precarity. It's, it's about vulnerability. And that does mean that the groups at the bottom will always be the ones who be competing with each other uh, because the people who are at the top are, are so insulated. You know, we talk about the impact of Brexit, we talk about the impact of the pandemic, which is massive, 
but there are privileged people in this country who will just sail through that. It will not affect them at all. And unfortunately, many of them are our um, esteemed politicians who are very, very privileged millionaires in their own right. So what that then does is you have all of these um, excluded, marginalized and vulnerable groups who are in a, in a precarious position. And so their most obvious competitors are other people who are in a similar position. And there's a kind of a Marxist analysis that we could do there about the working class turning in on itself and the, the wealthy just being completely um, out of, of the firing line. So I think that's what will happen. And I worry that that's going to get worse now because we're on the precipice of, a, of an economic catastrophe with COVID, not to mention Brexit. So it could be that we find that there's going to be even more antagonism, hostility, competition for scarce resources. And, you know, minority groups will always be the scapegoats in that situation. So if we're going to have solidarity, then I think we have to start also looking at the, the um, indigenous population as well, who are just going to be experiencing a lot of these vulnerabilities too. But yeah, I, I can see more of that competition coming in, in the future, unfortunately. Can I just add to, sorry, because, and that's a really good point, because we also now move back to the North and South divide in England because of COVID and because of Brexit. And it's interesting that the report looks at the Midlands relation to the arts and the visibility of Central and Eastern European artists in the Midlands. And I was interested that the report was saying they were going to explore other areas in the UK. And it'll be interesting to see how that um, divide between the North and South and the Midlands plays out as well in relation to fighting for resources and funding and all the other thing that comes with that as well. Yeah. There is one quite general question I left for the end, but I don't I don't think it's it's a massive it's one a massive one about where discrimination and exclusion come from. And um, I think this is a question about um, this is a question more about the background of all this and the sort of like a deeper context in which all of this is happening and all the exclusion and underrepresentation is happening. And uh, did someone ask if those who exclude migrants can be studied? Um, I think that we will not probably have time to uh, to discuss that and to explain that, but uh, but I think it's interesting. Um, Actually, yeah, I mean, I don't think we have time to answer that. No, no. I, think, no. Um, I mean, in t fully, I think we can touch on it, but I don't know if we have time to answer it fully. Um, I guess it's asking if we can study unconscious bias. Bias, yeah. Um, and I, and I, I think the answer is possibly no. Um, in terms of where discourses, these particular discourses come from, um, I think there's lots of sources, um, some that are very old, um, go back to um, kind of imaginaries of, of the East and, and Eastern Europe as a position between the West and the rest um, and sort of a, that, that kind of in-between space. Um, some are newer and relate to um, Cold War divisions um, and the constructed images of the other countries, the countries behind the Iron Curtain um, as being impoverished um, yes. and unfree. Um, and then post-Cold War, War, the idea that therefore everyone coming from those countries was, was escaping, coming to escape poverty, which then relates to, which kind of feeds into that construction of, of um, class and, and low skilled um, and, and, and all those things that feed into the then racism. Um, Louise, I don't know if you want to add to that because I mean, that's, that's much more your field as well. Well, I would agree with everything you said, Sarah, but I think it's it's just also about the fear. It's fear of the other, it's fear of the unknown, and whether it's Eastern Europeans or people coming from Africa or the Caribbean, it's the fear of outsiders. But it's it's not um, necessary. I think it's often fueled as well, and we have to look at who is fueling this. And if we look at the run-up to Brexit, you know, you can see that there are particular people in society who have a vested interest in stirring up and feeding these hostilities and racism uh, because it suits their interests. So we also have to kind of have a political analysis about what's going on there. So there's historical reasons, but there are also political reasons. And we only have to look at certain individuals on primetime television to see some examples of those people who are very good at stirring up that kind of uh, racialized tensions as well.
Yeah, and um, I also wanted to add that uh, what you've just mentioned, mentioned Sarah, um, this is also uh, what actually fuels um, the sort of inter um, competition within the migrant mig within migrant communities, all the class differences that's been there before. And you know, the more uh, the more Eastern European, Central European migrants are portrayed as you know fruit pickers and cleaners, the more more middle class migrants will try to dissociate themselves from them and from this kind of stereotyping, as well. So there is quite a lot of class division going on within within the within the within migrant communities along the sort of class lines, and. Um, and we've had in previous research, we had, you know, quotes like, you know, I never speak Polish on the street. I don't want to be seen as a cleaner. I don't associate with other folks in public and stuff like that. So this is this is this is this is something that's unfortunately happening as well. And especially again, you know, limited resources, competition. Um, this will be so this sort of united alliance we, we were talking before may be quite difficult to. Uh, although I'm very hopeful, and I know Alicia is very hopeful, and and um, for for that, I think it may be very difficult to do in practice as well in such um, in such situation. I think as we're at time, um, yes. then perhaps we and and we've asked all the questions, which I'm. I'm I'm, I'm glad that we did because it was really great. There was such a vibrant discussion around so many different themes as well, which was really um, great to see. Um, and also, I feel like we've, we've started some momentum. Um, and thank you, Pauline, and um, particularly for your offers to to get this this discussion going um, where it matters and where it can make a difference. Um, but thank you also to all of our panelists um, for uh, such great responses to the report, um, generous and 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 detailed readings of it, which has um, has been really fantastic and really inspiring. Um, and thank you, Kinga, um, for chairing the discussion so wonderfully. Um, do we have do we have any more questions that we want to answer? Or I think I think that um, I think we answered uh, most, if not all. There were some uh, repetitions in questions. I think that um, I think probably that's um, that's it. Obviously, it's not there's not enough time to um, you know discuss everything that we would like to discuss, and it's been such a rich report and such rich data. Uh, it's just not enough time to um, to discuss everything. But as you've said, Sarah, you know we've we've started this discussion and we started some sort of um, hopefully um, this will be the beginning of more in-depth discussions and some actual policy change because that's what it's supposed to be about some actual ch changes. So um, yes, I would like to thank all of you. Um, all the panelists, Louise, Pauline, and, and Alicia, and Sarah, of course. And I would like to um, thank all our attendees. Uh, there was fantastic attendance, and, and, um, and I hope that we will be continuing this discussion um, with you and, and with, with other and, uh, attendees that we, we had today, and this will be a beginning of actually some change 